in a big round of applause. It's well done. I need a star. <laughs> it goes downhill from here. Yeah. No, I'll hold it. Thank you. I, I want to. Um, I, I'm going to preach for a bit, and and then I've got a a, a good friend of mine who's going to give his testimony, which. Um, uh, so save yourself for the testimony. If you're going to sleep, just sleep during the first bit and then, you, you, you know, hear, hear what Dinesh is going to say afterwards. It's going to be great. But um, I'm going to read a, a, a quite a famous passage and uh, some of it you'll, you'll know very well. Um, but it, it's a really, well, I think it is, there is a, a, a verse in this that is the most important verse that you'll ever hear. So it's John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would, not, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen Philip said, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you, among you, for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing this work, his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the, the, I think we need to understand the context of this, this verse what is happening here. Jesus says right at the beginning, do not let your hearts be troubled. Their, their hearts were troubled. If you look at the two chapters beforehand, you see the, the triumphant entrance into Jerusalem that they were putting their hope in. This was going to be the new king. This was the one that was going to take the Romans and take back um, Jerusalem and Israel. He was God's Messiah. And suddenly that had changed. The crowds were turning. The leaders were not coming alongside with Jesus. Things were changing. And not only that, but he was saying things like, I'm going to go away and you can't go with me. And then he said, one of you is going to betray me. So they were all there thinking, well, uh, is it me? Is it me? Is it, is it that one? Is it that one? And he said to Peter, to the one he said he was going to build his church on, he said to Peter, you're going to deny me. All of these things must have been incredibly troubling for them. They didn't know. They, at the beginning of the week, they thought they knew what was going to happen. At the end of the week, they had no idea. So he was giving them that reassurance. And he was saying to them, First of all, that he was God. He said, believe in God and believe also in me. He was saying, I am God. He was saying to them that heaven was real. You're going to be with your father. And he said to them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. The picture that they had, they had, had got and this would have been really shocking for them. We've just shared communion. When Jesus first took the cup and gave it to his disciples, it was at the Passover feast. The cup that he gave them was the cup of the Messiah, 
the one that they'd been waiting for. But it was also the cup of the bridegroom. Because in Jewish culture, when, when, the bride, when somebody wanted to marry somebody, they would go to them with the family around and they would give them a cup. They would give the bride-to-be a cup. And that bride had the choice to either accept it or not. And once she'd accepted it, that was it. They were, they were effectively married. They were engaged. They were married. They were committed to that. And Jesus was saying, this is the cup I give to you. I'm offering to you, to my church, to us. And then he said, of course, in this chapter, he says, I'm going to go and build, uh, I'm going to my father's house. And there are many rooms. There are many houses, mansions. Because what the bridegroom would then do in that culture was go to his father's house and build an extension on the side of the house for him and his bride to go to. And the bride wouldn't know when that was going to be ready. And she would have to wait, like we are waiting as the church, for our bridegroom to come back to take us to himself. And that's what Jesus was promising, that I am going to be going there. You may have to wait, but I promise you that I will come for you as my bride. And he promised that they would know the Father. He said, if you see me, you have seen the Father. So many of us have been wounded by our fathers, by our earthly fathers, where they have not, none of us have had fathers that have lived up to our heavenly father in any way. I mean, they, 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 they may be little examples of that, and they may be, we may have had some very good parents, but none of us will live up to what our heavenly father is like. So it's not to our earthly fathers only that we look to as an example of what our heavenly father's like. We look to Jesus. And that was the promise, that was the reassurance that he was giving them. Look at me, and you will see the Father. And then in the context of all of that, he says this verse that is the most significant claim that you will ever hear. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It is not a casual throwaway line. It is the most significant claim ever made. Jesus is not some good teacher that we can take snippets of what he says and sort of add it to our lives. He's not one of many voices that we can listen to if we choose to. None of those stack up. And none of those, bearing in mind the claims that he was making, are acceptable. If Jesus is not who he claims to be, then he is either mad so that he is deluded and doesn't, he didn't understand what he was saying. He thought perhaps he was those things, but actually he wasn't. And if he is mad and deluded, we definitely do not want to be following him. Or he is extremely dangerous because he knew that what he was saying was a lie and yet he was leading people to believe it. And yet both of those things, bad or mad, don't add up with the life that we see Jesus live. So he is not some sort of fuzzy, warm teacher that we can all cuddle up to and feel nice about. Because he is either mad or bad or the most important person in the world that has ever walked on this earth. And if what he says is true, then it is the most significant statement that you will ever hear. And it is the most complete and important thing that the world needs to hear. If he's dangerous or he's mad, then he needed to be stopped. And we, needed to th we need to throw out what he was saying, not believe lots of nice teachings that he may have brought, just we need to throw out the whole lot, Jesus, Christianity, the church, 
everything goes. It is not a bit of something and a bit of something else. It is either we believe and we put our faith in him and our whole lives change or we ignore him. It demands a response. There is no halfway house with what Jesus says. So what is he saying? The last phrase, no one comes to the Father except through me. The Father, God, creator, the holy, all-powerful, mighty, almighty God, the judge, the one who started, created the world, and the one that will finish it. And Jesus is saying, that through him, we can have a relationship with this God. The God that, it, actually, if we come into his presence, he will, he will turn us into a cinder. We will burn up in his holiness. We cannot on our own come into his presence, but through Jesus, he says, we can have a relationship with him. We can live with him. We can enjoy eternity with him. And we can enjoy him for eternity. He's not some woolly, fuzzy, religious belief. And we can't choose Jesus along with a whole load of other gods. Or a whole load of snippets from other religions that we add in. It is either him or nothing. We either have to accept him and put our faith in him or we reject him. I don't believe there is any room for compromise for something that's halfway between the two. This is exclusivity. This is Jesus saying there is no compromise, there is no other way. And I have to say, in this world, that is incredibly unpopular and unacceptable in our society. Because how can we say that we have the truth and we know what is right and everybody else is wrong. But it's not us that's saying that, it's Jesus that's saying that. And we have to each of us weigh up. If you have made that decision to follow him, fantastic, because you know that already. If you haven't, you have to think about it. It is not something that you can just ignore and hope it will go away. Because it is either the most important and significant statement in the world, and Jesus is the most important person, or it is irrelevant. And he said, I am the way. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to show you a way, or I'm going to give you some clues, or I'm going to help you to find the way, as so many religions will say. He said, I am the way. It is through me that you get to the Father. I am the root. I am the means by which you can have a relationship with your Father. How? As we've talked about earlier, by the cross by what he did on the cross. You see, in the Jewish society, there, were, there was a system of sacrifices. And they would continually have to be sacrificing to try and deal with the sin in their life, the things that were getting between them and God. And they had to keep on doing it every year. Every year they had to come back again and again to, put the sac to do the sacrifices. But all they were doing was covering up their sin. They weren't actually getting rid of it. They weren't dealing with it. They were just covering it up. And they had to keep coming back. But Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect Passover lamb. And he was able to take all of our sin, past, present, and the future, on himself. So that we don't have to keep on doing those sacrifices because they've all been done for us. It is an amazing thing. It is too good to be true, but it is true. <laughs> he has done it. He is the perfect sacrifice. And he provides a way to the Father. And although I said that, that Christianity is exclusive, it is also inclusive because he has made it incredibly simple. He has said there is one way through him. There's not lots of 
different ways that you have to try and discover and find out. It is only one way. It is incredibly simple. Even the likes of me can understand that. And he said, I am the truth. Everything we hear, everything that we hear in the world, everything that people say to us about us, about the world, about God, has to be weighed in the light of who Jesus is and what he says. And today when we were worshipping, I was, I was weeping because there were, I was thinking there's people here, I mean we were talking about it with the folks from Celebrate Recovery, who have had lies spoken over their lives about who they are. You are rubbish. You are no good. You are, you'll never make anything of yourself. People have had those lies spoken over them. They are not true because Jesus speaks the truth over us that we are chosen, that we are adopted, that we are his, that we're loved, that we'll never ever be given up on. That is the truth. Jesus speaks the truth and we have to weigh these lies against the truth. We have to weigh, weigh what happens in the world, what the world is saying. Oh, Brexit, oh, the whole country's falling to pieces. The world's coming to an end. You know, it's terrible. Everything is just awful, what's happening around the world. We weigh that in the light of what Jesus says. That he is the one that will decide when this world is coming to an end. And he is the one that is going to come back at exactly the right moment. And everybody will know who he is. And every knee will bow, whether they want to or not. And they will confess that Jesus is Lord. He is the one. He is the truth. This is not something to ignore. Either what he says is true, and we have to measure everything against it, or it's not. And we need to steer well clear. I believe it is. He is what he says he is. And he says, I am the life. Now, this means a number of things. I mean, I've only got a few of them, but there's, there's lots of things. When he says, I am the life, life has no meaning without him. So many of us in this room can testify to that. Life has no meaning without him. You know what? If we believe that somehow we are accidentally created from some primeval sludge that, that then turned into amoebas and then turned into other things and then accidentally turned into other things so that we somehow accidentally turned up as we are now, we have no purpose at all other than to survive to the next generation. But Jesus gives us life. And he gives us purpose and meaning in life. We are living for him. He loves us. He has chosen us. We're going to live with him for eternity. There is purpose in life. And life actually is not life without him. Without him living in us, life is death. We inherit death. Because we've inherited it from, from Adam and from what he did. We inherit death. We carry death on our shoulders. Until we know him, and he then gives us life. And we, are, we get new life. We don't get some sort of done up, um, redecorated building. We get a completely new life with him. And not only that, but when he says, I am the life, he is saying, I'm giving you the ability to live life. I'm giving you the ability to overcome sin in your life. Before we were Christians, before we had the Holy Spirit living in us, I don't think we had that choice. We couldn't. We could try so hard, but we could never really overcome that sin in our lives. With him in us, we get to overcome. We get to live victorious lives. We get to fulfill all that he has called us to be and all that he wants us to, to have in him. To live life, real life, in him. Galatians 2.20 says, Christ lives in us. Now for those who have never experienced him living in, in you, turn to him. Believe what he says. Because it is worth it. He is worth every moment in life. <laughs> he, is, he is everything. 
absolutely everything. For those of us that already made that decision to let him be our life, to live in us, I challenge each of us, let's let him live more in our lives. Do we really let him live in our lives? Or do we still want control? Do we still want to to make our own decisions? To go where we want to go, when we want to go there? To have the things that we want? Or do we really let him live his life in us? There's a, a, a famous Christian called George Muller. I read his testimony, um, or his, his life story a little while ago. And incredible man, um, leading churches, doing a mis- missionary work across the world, um, and, and, and also running orphanages where he had thousands and thousands of children going through these orphanages that were given new hope in life. And when somebody in his, I think he was in his 80s, when somebody said to him, Mr. Muller, what is the secret of your life? And he bowed almost to the ground. And he said, the secret is that George Muller died many years ago. And that I don't live for me, I live for the Lord. And whatever he says I do, I do. And wherever he says I go, I go. That is the secret to life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Believe it, because it's true. Now, I want to invite Dinesh. Dinesh Chand is a, a pastor from North India who I met, Sue and I met um, two years ago when we were doing a LL prayer ministry course up in Scotland. And um, we, we had an amazing time for three weeks together learning what the Lord was teaching us and getting to know each other. And, uh, and um, we shared some, at that time some of Dinesh's uh, life and testimony. And, uh, and last night we had some of the, the elders came round to, to us and heard some more of that story. Um, and, uh, and Dinesh will speak, I assume now, about the things that I've just been talking about, some of the, the truth that he has discovered through, from coming from a Hindu background into um, to a faith in the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and Dinesh, I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time, but if you could speak now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. It's such a joy and a delight for me to be here this morning. My journey, my journey started from a very dark world where I was, I came from a Hindu background. I was born in a Hindu family in a Hindu town, in a Hindu state. About 40,000 people living in this town. When I was very young, probably eight or seven or eight years old, I began to show interest into the spiritual world, began to go to temples. My parents were really super, super impressed with me because I was showing such an interest. And they also pointed me that I should follow certain ritual, do some fasting and chanting or memorizing some of the words or the verses of Hindu scripture, I began to do that. By the time I was 10 years old, I was reading a passage in that Hindu book where it talks about a meditation. It means that you really want to, if you really want to experience God face to face, or you really want to hear him, or you really want to speak to him, then you leave your family home, comfort, and go in a lonely place, and sit in one position and meditate. And if your meditation is good enough, then God will appear in front of you. Well, that thought really attracted me. And one morning, I decided, I was 10 years old, that I'm going to leave everything, go in the woods, and look for God. Well, I went away. And the uh, book also talks about, sometime it may take you 12 years. And I was prepared for that. I went there, sat on a big rock hoping that God will appear in front of me, but I couldn't really survive there for 12 hours. Changed my mind, and I came back. But my search did not stop. Now, question of Jesus is not even there. You will wonder why. In my town, 40,000 people, not even a single one who knew anything about Jesus. I mean, you are very fortunate 
that you, you're living in a place where, where, I mean, you can practically find the information in any direction, in any way, through newspaper, television, radio, and whatsoever. I'm sure there are tens of churches right around you. And I was in a place where I couldn't find, you know, what Jaya was talking about. I was looking for that way. I was looking for that life, that truth. But I was involved in somewhere altogether in a complete darkness. And everybody pointed me that I should knock this door and knock that door, go to this place and go to that place, uh, hoping that I can find some answer for my life. Nothing happened. By the time I was 18 years old, I came to this point of frustration and disappointment that I concluded that perhaps uh, there is no God. And so I became an atheist. I started believing there is no God. By this time, I was already in college. And when I was in college, I started living that lifestyle of believing in no God. I finished my college, then I went to another college for my further professional study. In this college, this was my first year. One morning, I was on the way to the, co to the college. I stopped in a small cafeteria to have my breakfast. As I was having my breakfast, I saw a lady across my table reading her Bible. And she happened to be a tourist lady from New York City. She was not a missionary, just a simple, ordinary person who was perhaps having her own devotion in the breakfast table. And that is when I saw the Bible very first time. I was 22 years old. And I, was, I, I began to, to sort of wonder, what kind of book is she reading? Because I had never seen the Bible. I thought it doesn't look like a textbook. It doesn't look like any college or school or any kind of a normal book. So anyway, finally we started talking. She started sharing with me about Jesus. We had a very good conversation. And after a good conversation, I said, it was really good talking to you, but I'm not really interested in it. So we said goodbye to each other. She was back in the U.S. I was back in my college. Now after almost one year went by, and one morning... I happened to be in the same cafeteria, and I saw her again, and she started sharing with me about Jesus. Again, we had a very good conversation, but at the end of, at the, end of the conversation, I said, I'm not really interested. It doesn't sound too right yet. So I said, I'm not interested, and we said goodbye to each other. She was back in the U.S. I was back in my college. Now, this is the third year. After, after almost about a year later, I happened to be in the same restaurant. And guess what? We bumped into each other. She shared with me again. But at the end of the conversation, I said, I'm not quite sure about it. We said goodbye to each other. But that night when I went to my apartment, and as I was trying to sleep, it's almost somebody came in my bedroom and turned my, my, turned my life history right from the beginning, and it's just passing in front of me. And I couldn't sleep. My heart was gripped with fear. You know why? Because I thought, I think God is knocking my door, but I am actually, I have a heart in my heart. And what would happen if I don't see her again? How would I go to him? How would I really have this discussion anymore with anybody else? So I couldn't sleep. Early morning, 5 o'clock, it was still dark. And I decided to go straight to a hotel and uh, knock on the door at early morning, 5 o'clock. And she opened the door. And I said, you have been telling me about this God of yours. I need to experience him today, now. And that morning, I gave my heart to Jesus. And since then, it has been an absolute marvelous journey walking with Jesus. Now I continue my college. And after finishing my college, now I'm getting ready to start my career. I knew what kind of a job I would have. I knew exactly five years, 10 years, 20 years, and what type of package I will have by the time I would retire. And just before, a week before I would join this company, my career, I hear this voice. And the voice is like this. It says, Dinesh, I don't want you to join the industry that you are trained for you will lose yourself. Serve me and you will find yourself. 
I started having this conversation with the Lord. I said, Lord, I accepted you as my Lord and Savior. That's just the beginning to know you. That doesn't mean that I know you fully. It's just a beginning. It's just a, I'm just starting to know you better. And you're asking me to actually, the something that I have learned over four years, to leave that and go in the direction that I have a, no clue. And the Lord said, that's right. That's right. I said, I got, God, I don't even own a Bible. I haven't even gone to a church yet. I don't even, where, I don't even know how to start or where to start. And you're asking me to serve you, to go after you. And this voice became stronger and stronger and stronger. And uh, before even I joined, I never joined the company. I actually took the letter and threw in the trash one day. A week before, I said, okay, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm going to go after you. And he reminded me. You know, I, I, I still remember so clearly that by the time I would be 90 years, that makes that I would definitely live for 90 years for sure. You know, by the time I would be 90 years, you'll ask me this question to me. That have you found out the purpose of your life? And I think that's the question he's asking all of us. He's asking all of us. I mean, we can live and rejoice and come to church every Sunday and be happy and, and just have this, uh, you know, wonderful environment. But there is a question that God is asking. Are we living according to his purpose on a daily basis? And that's what God is asking. So then I said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna, I want to serve you, but where do I start? Let's go to a church. So I went to the church very first time. I'm standing at the very back. This church had a tradition to welcome the newcomer. And as my turn was about to come, and you wouldn't believe, my legs started shivering. And my head started sweating, and my throat started choking. With my choking voice, I introduced myself. And then I said, Lord, I can't even introduce myself. I mean, this is so awkward to be the, be, with these people in this church. Because I had never been in that kind of environment. And how would I do anything here? Anyway, I sh at the end of the service, I went to the pastor and, and again, again introduced myself. I said, is there any area where, where I can serve him or where I, can, where I can be involved without talking to too many people? Because there seems to be too many people here. And he said, maybe you have to figure it out. And I, I realized that I can do nothing in that place. I mean, I can, of course, preaching and teaching and all the singing and playing anything. I can't even touch that. I said, Lord, where do I start? So I still remember it. Uh, you know, coming from a management background, I took a little tab and said, okay, let me, look, let me look it out. And I came to the church. I saw, oh, there's chairs, there's wires, there's a bathroom, there's a reception. There's so many things that I don't need any qualification. I don't need any training. I can do it. I begin to do this. And as, would, as I would line up those chairs, making sure they're not even one centimeter off, there's no doubt in my heart that I was not serving him. And that's where it is. You know, God is not after our qualification. And often that is what we think. If he is after, he's only after our heart. Where is our heart? And you know when, when you hand over your heart, he takes in his hand so carefully and so beautifully and so gently. And then he fashions it. Because he has a dream for you more than you can have a dream for yourself. And then he fashions you. He makes you a person that perhaps you, it would never even come in your dream that you can be like that. And I said, I began to do that soon. I was involved in prayer meeting, youth meeting, Bible study, you name it, and I was there. Then I went to Bible school, went back, and four years later, that very church ordained me as the pastor of the church. So now I'm pastoring this church. Another four years went by. Then my wife, who happened to be from the U.S., and she was on a short-term mission. Her trip was supposed to end in three months. Now it's been 22 years. <laughs> we got married right after we, we knew the Lord is calling us to be together. And I was only, we were only two weeks married. And the Lord reminded me. He reminded me, you remember when you were younger, you couldn't find Jesus. You couldn't find the Lord that you were looking for. Why? Because there was none. What about them? I said, Lord, I'm very content in this place right now. I'm pastoring a church. I also have, I'm married. 
And life is good. If you, really, if you really want to reward me, reward me, send me to a bigger and a better city. I consider that's a promotion. Sending me back to my place, that's not a promotion. That's a demotion, Lord. And the Lord continued to say, what about them? And I started having this conversation with the Lord. And the, I said, Lord, okay, I'm ready to go. But what do you want me to do? What exactly? This is a place that has never, never been reached by any mission or by any, even, even other faith than the Hinduism. Over 99% of them are Hindus. And that's what God was calling. I mean, this is a place when we even Persian 900 AD, when the king from Persia, Iran, they came to India and they turned south. Why? Because they saw this tall, high, I mean, mountains. And they thought climbing those mountains with those camels will be a suicide. So they turned south. This is a place which is absolutely has been untouched by any other faith than Hinduism. You can imagine, even, even today, you will find temples over 500, 600, 1,000 years, and even longer than that. And that's where God was calling us. And then God said, go and pray. I said, okay. So we resigned from all the responsibility. My wife and I, we just packed up and we moved up in the mountain. Well, in the back of my mind, I thought, I'm sure within a week or 10 days when we start praying, he'll tell us exactly what, he will, what we are supposed to do. And if that doesn't happen within a week or 10 days, you know, we'll just go and buy some of those books and read them, how to hear him better and deeper. And if that doesn't happen another week or 10 days, then we go on our knees and literally create some scars and say, Lord, can you see the knees, how much we are praying? And if that doesn't happen, then we sort of call it gently, sort of a hunger strike, fast fasting. You know, we'll do the fasting and we'll make him speak to us. You know, sometimes we come up with this plan so clearly, but the Lord's plan is altogether different. And we begin to pray. We begin, as, and then I, as we were praying, then one day, the Lord, Lord asked me a question. And I think that's the question he's asking us, all of us, even today. And he said to me, Dinesh, tell me, how many of my lost children can you really reach in your lifetime? I immediately raised my hand to the Lord. I said, Lord, 5,000. I mean, looking to Indian population, 5,000 is nothing, you know. And the next second, I changed my answer to 10,000. And next second, I said, no, Lord, I can do better than that, 15,000. No, Lord, I can do better than that, 20,000. And then after that, I was quiet. And the Lord said, that's it? I said, well, by this time, I probably would be old and getting ready to leave this planet. And this is what he said. He said, whatever you do in my name, I'm going to bless you. But then there's a little pause. And after the pause, he said, but if you pray and seek my face, you will be blessed beyond you can imagine. So take your pick. The blessing is in both ways. Sometimes we ask God to join us. And sometimes he says, I'm already doing something. I'm already on a, on, a, on, a, on a sort of a path or a victory. Why don't you come and join me? Because then blessing is beyond your little mind can even think and imagine. I mean, I could be happy and content with 20,000 people in that, or I can go, you know what? I don't know how many people the Lord has in his mind. So let's go that path. Let's go that, that way. So we begin to pray. We prayed for one month, two months, three months. We had prayer teams from coming from all over the world and from India. We were from five days to 14 days. Only doing one thing is praying and seeking, God, what plan, what strategy you have for these people who have never been reached in the history? What, what kind of a blueprint you have in your hands that you want us to have it and you are willing to give us, but what is that? We prayed. We prayed for one month, two months, three months, four months. Uh, we had friends from overseas, and they called us, hey, we would like to come and work with your ministry and help you. I said, please come and come and pray with us. And they said, you mean you want us to spend thousands of dollars, come to your country, sit in a room and pray? I said, exactly. And they said, we'll pray about it. And many came. Many came just to pray so that we can seek his strategy. Almost one year went by, and 14 months and when four, after 14 months, one day I said, Lord, I mean, I just had this direct conversation with the Lord. I said, Lord, why do you take so long to answer our prayer when we are ready, willing to do anything for you? I mean, that's a very valid question. And God is not going to get upset, believe me. He's not going to be upset on you if you ask. And the Lord said to me, 
right there and then. He said, you think, you think through your prayer I'm moving the mountains around you? You think through your prayer I'm changing everyone around you? I said, exactly, that's what you're supposed to do, Lord. When we pray, you're supposed to move our mountains. When we pray, you're supposed to move everything, every change, everyone around us. And the Lord scolded me right there and then. And he said, I'm not moving any mountains, and I'm not changing anyone either. But if there is anyone, I'm changing. That's you. I said, I get it, Lord. You know, and that's when God really taught me the definition of prayer. According to me, it's my definition. Prayer means is simply entering in his presence. Nothing more, nothing less. Your request that you carry in your pocket, that's just a sort of a li list that you have, like a shopping list or whatever you call it. It's, it's, it's complimentary to, for you to have that answer for that. It's a bonus. It's not the primary. In other words, the prayer is definitely it's a tool, but more than a tool, it's an atmo atmosphere where you can enjoy, where you can enjoy Father's presence and, and, and be delighted in your heart that I am going... Not a, not a boring place where I would be bored because there's, I'm going so I can enjoy my father. And that's what Lord really taught me then. So we continued to pray. I said, okay, Lord, we'll continue to pray. Another two months, six, 16 months went by, and still we don't have any strategy, no clue, no idea. And then one day, I was walking in the street, and I saw a few people working on the side of the road. And I saw one lady, she has, uh, she's taking 15 to 20 pounds stone. And she's trying to break the stone with this small hammer. And she will just strike right on the center of the stone. And you can see the stone is very strong. And the hammer is very small. And the strike seems to be insignificant because the hammer is bouncing back. But as she stood faithful and striking again and again, a little mark is taking place. Again, strike again and again, and fine cracks are developing. And again, striking again and again, and this stone turned into two pieces. I said, thank you, Lord. You know, our walk with the Lord is exactly the same way. We make a visible move. We make a visible strike. But somehow we fail to see an invisible impact that is happening. I tell you, it's always when you, when you move with the Lord, there is something happening that you can only feel and see with your spiritual eyes, not with your physical eyes. We continue to pray. 18 months later, finally the gave, Lord gave us the strategy. He said, I want you to train local indigenous people and help them plant churches. Very first training, I was super excited. Only four people showed up. I said, Lord, finally 18 months of prayer. Now you only gave four months. We are trying to reach 7 million people. And the Lord said, do not despise the small beginning. We trained those four people, send them back. I said, come back. A few weeks later, they came back. They brought eight more. We sent them back. They brought 16 and 20 and 30. And once we had 60 people right in our living room. And today, fast forward from 2000 and 2019. In the town where we live, it's a pretty big town. There's not a big enough hall that we can hire for our entire training in one sitting. There are more than 100,000 believers in our state alone are worshiping the Lord every single Sunday. Now the Lord has spread the work in so way in seven different states and three different countries. God has already done amazing work that my mind can even think and imagine. At the end, I want to read you uh, one verse, and then I'll leave that verse with you. It's in uh, John 15 and verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you may, that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. I want you to know something. That you're not here by chance. You're all chosen and appointed for a great fruit that is waiting there. God bless you. Thank you. We're just going to see a video, so if you can just look what founded with a vision to train local indigenous church planters to reach their people groups for Jesus, to see a church planted in every unreached village of North India. My name is Ram Nalevi. This is my wife. I have been granted to the Lord for 25 years. I have been granted to the Lord for 25 years. 
मैं बीमार था और मेरी आंखें भी चली गई थी और मेरे कान भी चले गए थे फिर प्रभु ने प्रभु ने मुझे कान तो दे दिए और आंखें बंद कर प्रभु मेरे साथ आए मेरे साथ आए सामर्थ्य शक्ति दी और प्रभु ने कहा कि जाओ तुम जाओ लोगों को बताओ दो तेरे मेरे लिए प्रभु ने कितने कितने बड़े बड़े काम किए बस वही मैं गवाही बताता हूँ लोग के बहुत सारे लोग मेरे साथ प्रार्थना करने जा इस जगह पर आते हैं हाँ जी मेरा बहुत विरोध हुआ क्योंकि मुझे मेरे छत पर पत्थर मारे ए आर एस के लोग मुझे रामपुर ले गए और मुझे डराया धमकाया मुझसे कहा कि परमेश्वर को छोड़ दो और अपने देवी देवता मांगो मैंने कहा कि मैं सब कुछ कर सकता हूँ परमेश्वर तो कभी नहीं छोड़ सकता Pastor Law is just one of hundreds of pastors trained by Forefront who have planted churches over the last